Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today we're going to paint some swans. So what I have here is a sheet of 9 by 12 watercolor paper. It's actually in a block. And I have drawn on a few of the smaller swans already. And together we're going to draw the big ones. So we're going to start by um, using a pencil to draw kind of like a, a rounded triangle for the body. See, we got that nice shape there. Kind of looks like a rock. We're going to draw a curved, slightly curved line for the neck and double it up so we get two lines. Then we're doing a wing here where we're just kind of putting another one of those um, curvy triangles again. And then we're just putting another curvy line here to represent kind of the uh, fluff over the leg. And then we've got the pointy little tail feathers. There we go. And we're going to put an oval on for the head and a little triangle for the beak. So really it's just basic shapes and we have got a swan all drawn. Now the reference photo I'm using, I have a link below the video in the video description to it. It is a photograph by the photographer John Sullivan and he runs the website uh, p, uh, publicdomainphoto.org. It's pdphoto.org if you want to check it out. And he has a lot of wonderful photographs there. So now what you need to do is wet the background of the painting. We're going to wet every Everything except for the swans with clear water and a large brush and the reason we're not wetting the swans is that the paint is only going to go where the water is so if you only wet the area of the picture that is the water that's where our paints gonna go so it's a lot easier to handle we're only going to use four colors in this painting we're going to use yellow ochre uh, ultramarine blue burnt sienna and sap green and we'll be able to mix everything we need from those four colors. So as soon as you have that background wet, I want you to mix up some juicy puddles of each of those colors, especially the ultramarine blue. There we have it right there. And a nice big juicy puddle of that. You're also going to want a nice puddle of burnt sienna, that reddish brown right there. And when we mix it together, we get a nice kind of soft gray. You can make it warmer or cooler depending on how much blue you add, but we want, we want it a little more cool, so a little more blue. And start applying that starting at the top of your paper and working your way down. This will dry lighter, so just keep that in mind while you're painting. Uh, so you want to apply the paint so it's a little bit darker than what you uh, will want to end up with. Just keep bringing that color down the painting and um, just take your take care around the swan so you don't you don't cover them up completely with paint adding a little bit more blue there just to kind of bring in a little more color and darken it up at the top this is just a general unifying wash here it really uh, helps us get all those get some of those colors we're going to use um, in the rest of the picture too these um, swans, this photo was taken in Ireland, uh, the photographer said on his blog. So it's kind of neat to know that little bit, of, little bit of information there. I've never been to Ireland, so it was exciting to kind of see them. I think their colors, they, I think their climate and their colors are very similar to what we have in Maine um, because I was very comfortable painting from this photograph. The colors seemed very, um, uh, very familiar. And notice we're painting right over where our reflections are going to be. Now I'm adding some sap green onto my palette and I'm picking it up with some of the blue. And the reason I'm doing that is because we're going to have some grasses and reeds growing in the, uh, in the water around the swan. So I want to get that color in now as one of our reflection colors. And notice how I'm applying the color in back and forth strokes with the chisel edge of my brush to kind of start to add that, start to get that, wa that um, water movement. Now I'm lifting up the highlights, or reflections rather, from the swans. So I'm just blotting my brush off and setting it in the paint to soak it up. And I'm just wiping it away, just wiping away that paint. That's all there is to it. Ultramarine blue, sap green, and burnt sienna are all very sedimentary colors, which means they lift up really easily. So um, that's a great reason to use it for a background. That's why I love to do my washes with those types of colors. And again, I'm just lifting up that wet paint and wiping it on my paper towel. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Now in a moment here <laughs> during the video I get interrupted and I pause the video so my picture actually is going to dry on me a little bit so I'm going to show you exactly uh, what to do when you've got your background washes dry and you want to lift up a reflection. So now my paper is dry 
And um, on that swan that's right close to the right side of the paper, I'm using a wet brush and I'm just brushing over that uh, dry paint. And look, it's just lifting it up. It's, it's reliquifying it, just like the paint on our palettes. So I'm able to uh, lift up that paint and just kind of wipe it away, just like I was before. I can even dab it up with a paper towel. Just make sure you don't rub your paper. Never rub it because you can uh, end up pilling your paper. And what, right there, I had splashed some water, so I actually had to blot it off and it, it took off some, even some more paint. So there I am just uh, still lifting out my highlights and my reflections uh, from the water, the reflections of the swans in the water. Really, painting a picture is very easy if you know what to do. This is a beginner tutorial. Um, I think it might be kind of daunting if you're a beginner and you're trying to paint reflections in the water. This just makes it a little easier. I'm just drying my paper here. You can do it with a heat gun or a hair dryer or you can just, you know, let time dry it. I wanted to get on to um, the next stage of the painting, so I'm just using my heat tool to dry it up. And uh, I notice my lighting is a little better now. It's nice and bright and... Uh, Correct. I don't know why it always starts off kind of yellow. Huh. Uh, one of the great mysteries in life. Here is a new paintbrush that I wanted to try out. It was a uh, cat's tongue, a number six size. I feel like it's still a little too small for me. Um, but I, I used to have one that was larger that I really liked, but I couldn't find it. So I ordered that um, in my last supply order from Blick, and uh, it was on sale, a couple bucks. Um, but I, I would just wish it was a little bigger. I'm taking some yellow ochre and I'm just adding it into the head, neck, and onto some of the back feathers, kind of where the sun would be hitting them. Just a very, very light yellow ochre wash in those areas. That uh, The nice thing about a cat's tongue brush, it's kind of like a flat brush because you get the width, but it comes to a nice point so you can get in there to get some details. Um, but because the cat's tongue brushes generally come to a point, you can go with a much larger brush and be able to carry more color. So uh, that's going to take a little getting used to for me. I'm not sure if I like that, that smaller one. We'll see. Um, I think I just need to play with, it, play with it a little more. The gray that I'm using is just the mix of ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. And I am just um, going in and adding shadows on the swans. Even though swans are white, it's not just white. That's not the only color we see. We're going to see grays. We're going to see yellows. We're going to see um, other colors that are around the swans kind of um, being cast onto the white feathers. So you want to really be mindful of that. And that's where a good photograph comes in or painting from life when you can actually see, um, you know, get up close and see your subject. So that's something to consider. Always look for the colors that are unexpected. You know a swan is white. You want to look for the other colors that aren't as obvious. Now I'm going to switch to a larger brush here. I have a half inch flat or number 12 flat and it's either a Cotman or a Lowell Cornell. I'm not sure which. They're both very good brushes. And I'm just tapping in some of the shadows on the, fo uh, the focal uh, swan there. And since it is closer, I want to use a bigger brush. It's a bigger subject. That will just help everything kind of um, look a little different from each other and help give me a little perspective and just you know, it's more appropriate to use a bigger brush on a bigger subject. And same thing for that guy behind him. Just adding a little bit of, uh, a little bit of my handmade gray. And I'm also turning my paper when I need to so I can get right up against the edge that I want to get to. I can keep everything comfortable to paint. Don't be afraid to move your painting around. Tape your paper down to a small board or a piece of cardboard or something you can move. You really want to be comfortable when you paint. If you paint in an awkward position for too long, you're going to feel it in your shoulders or your back, and it's just not going to be um, not going to be sustainable to do that. I've gone back to the smaller brush and some more of that gray, a little bit darker though, and I'm just sharpening up my shadows a little bit more. Just getting in there a little bit with that brush. Um, I, I'm curious to know what you think about the voiceover. I wasn't really happy with how long the uh, video was, so I thought this would be a great way to... Um, <laughs> to kind of make it go a little quicker and also I wasn't feeling that coherent today. It was just a really kind of hot, humid day. I'm feeling kind of slow and lazy, <laughs> I guess. Here I've used a little bit of a more concentrated mix of burnt sienna and ultramarine blue to make that nice black for around the um, 
the eyes and beak. And for the beak itself, I'm going to use burnt sienna and uh, yellow ochre, and that's going to be orange enough for our beaks. So I was worried. I thought I might have to add in some yellow or some red or some orange that I haven't used yet in this picture. But luckily, this color was a beautiful natural orange for this, this mix. So I could stick to my same four colors that I've been using the whole time. I really think that makes for a much more professional looking composition. Uh, just, you know, you can, a mark of an amateur painting is when you see that they've used every color on their palette. They haven't bothered to mix anything. The colors are discordant. Um, and sometimes you might want that effect, but generally you don't. Generally you want, you know, a sense of harmony and unity in your painting and by mixing your own colors you get that. So here I've taken ultramarine blue and sap green and I am adding some ripples in the water. I'm using the full range of motion in my hand and my whole arm is moving from shoulder to wrist. I am sweeping my hand back and forth in jiggly strokes but I'm only touching my brush to the painting surface um, here and there. So that way my arm is always moving when, and then I set my brush down here and there and that gives me that nice choppy water look. Just those little choppy strokes that you need, but you want constant movement in your hand and just kind of tap, tap down every once in a while to deposit the paint onto your surface. Boy, I feel like I'm talking faster than usual. I'm uh, sorry about that. I'm just a little, um, a little, oh, I don't know, uneasy, not used to doing the, uh, the voiceover. Uh, so here what I'm doing is I'm bringing down, my strokes are staying parallel to the top and bottom of my paper. But what I'm doing is I'm kind of pulling a kind of V composition through the picture. So your eye is being, uh, will travel from the upper right hand uh, corner of the picture down to the center. And then it's going to go down to the lower right hand section. So it gives a little bit of movement and rhythm to the piece. And it's something you don't really think about when you're painting. But I want to kind of impart those rules to you or those little suggestions so that when you're working on a composition, you're sketching something out and things just aren't looking right or you just don't feel like it has enough um, interest to draw the viewer in, maybe you can think of how you've arranged your subject um, and maybe you can add something in the background or add some unifying marks like these this, this ripple of of water, these ripples, it ties the, the swans together, it unifies the piece, it gives movement, it draws the viewer's eyes around. So it's not just random ripples. And when you know things like that, you can apply them to your paintings to make for nicer, stronger paintings and really get your, um, your uh, I don't know, ideas and um, intent across. And don't be afraid, like you can see, I'm moving that painting all over the place so it's comfortable when I paint it. I've actually, I'm, now I'm standing up. I was sitting down at the beginning of this painting and now I'm standing up so I can see a little bit better and so I'm more comfortable. So, you know, keep that stuff in mind when you're painting. Don't be afraid to get up, move around, stretch, take a break, come back to it. You know, this should be fun. It's not work. It should be fun. You should really enjoy yourself. I think you will once you find, once you, um, once you start painting, I think you're really gonna, gonna enjoy it. So I'm just deepening up my shadows here. I'm adding some more of the sap green and um, ultramarine. Have a little burnt sienna in there too when I want to gray it up a little bit more. Um, I've switched to a larger round brush at the bottom because uh, a bigger brush will give me bigger waves and that will um, help add a little bit of uh, perspective. Having larger things at the front makes it look closer to you, makes it look more um, realistic and having the smaller waves further away from your eyes, back further in the picture, makes them look further away, just like the smaller swans look further away. It's all scale and perspective. There was just adding a little bit of shadows into the reflections of the swan. Since the, the swans have reflections in their bodies, they're going to have some in the water too. So you just want to make sure you kind of, um, that everything is believable and everything kind of matches and, and harmonizes and goes together. Just like when you think about how the light is hitting and everything, that everything has, is having light hit, hit it from the same direction. And, you know, it's just all those little things you want to, you, you just, they come instinctively when you've been painting for a while. But you have to think about it a little bit when you begin, if you haven't been painting too long. All right, now um, we've got our swans in there. I am taking a fan brush and a little bit of ultramarine blue, and I'm just dragging it um, on the really the top of my picture, which would be the ripples really, really far away. So I just kind of wanted to get some little silvery ripples further away just to help um, help you have that a little bit more perspective, a little bit more depth in the picture. Now I'm drying this off because I want to start painting in some of the reeds and grasses that are growing around our swans. 
and I have my little cat's tongue brush that I've been getting used to. It's a synthetic, I think it's a, a it's a Princeton brush. I think it's a Neptune synthetic. I'm not 100% sure, but um, I think that's, I, somebody recommended that, and I think that's what I was trying to, uh, to do there. And I'm using a little burnt sienna at the bottom, just flicking up some little marks, and then I am adding some sap green. Just uh, so I have these kind of like reeds that are darker at the bottom and they're more green and fresh as they're growing up out of the water. Again, using that smaller brush um, in back there so that I'll have finer blades of grass and then I can have larger ones as I come forward. I've got a little yellow ochre in there too, I can see. So again, we're using the same colors. We're using burnt sienna, sap green, and yellow ochre for our grasses. If you want to darken up the bottoms, you can do burnt sienna with a little bit of ultramarine. Doesn't it make it easier when you only have four colors to worry about? I think so. And I'm also strengthening that V composition, that sideways V kind of zigzag I was showing you. I'm strengthening that um, by adding grasses in those same areas. It helps give a nice setting for our swans. They're protected in the little thicket of the, uh, of the reeds in the water, and uh, it's just a very calming painting. It's nice. I don't see how you could be. Oops, sorry about that. I just brushed the microphone. I don't see how you could be upset when you're uh, when you're painting something like this. Imagine sitting on the banks by your pretty little swans. I feel like Bob Ross now, having a Bob Ross moment. Oh my goodness! All right, now I've got some yellow ochre and sap green. I'm, I want these grasses here at the front that are coming off the bottom of the paper. You notice how I'm starting them right off, right on the edge of the the paper here. I want those to be brighter, warmer in color, so they'll advance for uh, towards us, and it also um, help our perspective look really believable, help this look like a really uh, believable picture, and uh, strengthen our composition. I've just got some little, um, little bit of burnt sienna in there too. Now at this time I'm trying to decide whether or not I want to put cattails in this picture because I just see this and I think, you know what, really, this would really look good with some cattails, and I'm not sure if they have cattails in Ireland where this photo was taken, but I guess nobody really has to know that, uh, that that was done in Ireland. Um, I've got a little uh, burnt sienna and ultramarine, and I'm just adding little uh, bits of shadow underneath the reeds here. Um, obviously, the water would be a little bit more shallow here, so I'm adding just you know some shadows. I'm adding more grass behind that swan because I feel like he was just getting kind of um, kind of kind of losing him in there. So I wanted him to show up a little bit more. I got a little on his head, so I was just kind of. Uh, Trying to erase it there. There I go again. Trying to, <laughs> I had to lift up that color off his head because I accidentally, uh, accidentally got some green on there. So you know, hey, I make mistakes too. You just fix them. No biggie. And I'm dragging in some more grasses there. Still, still pondering the cattail idea. And a little more blue and brown mix to make that gray shadows in the water. The little shadows on the grass. They, they're really um, also anchoring that grass in the water so they don't look like it's just grasses hovering over the lake. We don't want hovering grasses. That's not good. We're just kind of giving them a place to kind of kind of sit and be anchored. Also those little shadows right where that little line of gray where the swan touches the water, that is a that also helps the swan feel like it's kind of sitting in the water and not floating. Well, it is floating technically, but you know not hovering over the water, I guess. And again, with that homemade gray that we made with burnt sienna and ultramarine, we're adding a few little more shadows in there. Just help uh, help define that focal one. He should have the most definition and the most time should be spent on him because um, that's the one that is really in front and it should have the most detail because it's the closest to the viewer. Now, if I wanted to, I could take a, an X-Acto knife and scrape out a little highlight for the eye, but I really don't think it's necessary. I think that that's kind of nice just the way it is. I decided that I did want to do cattails, so I took burnt sienna, and I'm just kind of making these kind of rounded rectangles. If you've ever seen a cattail, they kind of look like a corn dog on a piece of grass. <laughs> I know, it's very appealing, isn't it? But that's kind of what they look like. And um, then I'm adding a little bit of ultramarine blue at the bottom of each of those, just and letting it kind of bleed in for a shadow. And then I'm taking a little bit of yellow ochre and just dragging up these little kind of dry grassy bits off the top. That's what they look like. I don't know what you call that part, but I walk by cattails every day and that's, they, they look like that, trust me. And I'm going to put a few over here just to balance out the composition a little bit. Now, if you don't want cattails, don't put them in there. You know, that's completely up to you. I was just feeling like 
you know, I'd rather wreck my painting if you don't, you know, and if it doesn't come out good, then, you know, who cares? But I'd rather, that way you can see whether you would like to do it or not, rather than have me suggest it and then try it. And if you don't like it, I'd rather you look at mine and say, gee, Lindsay, that's not good. I don't like that. And not do it to yours, you know, rather than, you know, you try it on yours and wish you hadn't. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take one for the team there. So thumbs up and subscribe if you like this video. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think of the voiceover. And until next time, happy crafting.